the wheel of this car is a man torn between two worlds. He's an Arab sheikh who was born in an old Arabia and will die in a new one. He worships Allah, loves the desert, and is one of the richest men in the world. His name is Zaid. <laughs> Zaid rules a little kingdom in Arabia called Abu Dhabi. 20,000 people in a stretch of sand and salt flats about half the size of Denmark. To the tribesmen who follow him everywhere, he's the undisputed boss. His forefathers ruled the desert from the back of a camel. He rides it in a limousine. But he remains, as they were, the center of tribal life. He's the man you serve the man you hunt with, and the man you fight for. Above all, he's the man who leads. Wherever Zaid goes, his men go too. Those who don't travel with Zaid come out of the desert to greet him. They all owe their loyalty to him, and they all expect rewards from him. Zaid's tastes have not been influenced much by his money. He likes the simple life, to drive himself, to go hunting and camping in the desert, to be with his people as a sheikh should be, to follow the ways of the old Arabia. <laughs> Five or six years ago, the people of Abu Dhabi were sunk in the poverty of a thousand years or more. The 20th century had passed them by. Today, their ruler, Zaid, is one of Arabia's nouveau riche, who's acquired overnight a fortune from oil. His income could give $5,000 a year to every man, woman, and child in the place, enough to make Zaid a multimillionaire. Superficially, the old customs are unchanged. The tent goes up as it always did. The food is prepared as simply as before. <laughs> Zaid's natural pace is leisurely, almost indolent. Time is about the only thing the desert's been rich in until now. Time for coffee. Time for talk. Time made into ritual from century to century, from morning till night. These girls will swing their hair, and these men will chant hour after hour. In the desert, there's no rush. At least, that's how it used to be. But Zaid, with his money, has begun to learn better. In this palace in Abu Dhabi, Zaid had a brother. His name was Shakput, and for more than 30 years he ruled Abu Dhabi in poverty and comparative peace. Shakput's rule was traditional. His word was law, but he stayed close to his people. Anyone was free to talk to him any day in the Majlis, the tribal council, and as long as they had no money, they were all relatively contented. And then in the 1960s, Abu Dhabi struck it rich, and its trouble started. In a year or two, people were demonstrating about work and wages who'd never had either in their lives before. The grumbles grew as the money mounted, because Shackwood was a miser. All his life, he'd been a poor man. Now that he was rich, the skin flint habits stuck. And like a man who's won first prize in a lottery, 
he found his money made few friends. People began to say his brother, Zaid, would be a better ruler. He had a mind more open to the world. He was generous. He was a man's man. But Zaid had sworn to his mother years ago that he would never harm Shackwood. And for five more years he stayed loyal. And the people waited. The oil flowed. The money poured in, but Shackwood wouldn't spend it. He was paralyzed by habit, suspicion, and downright fear. He knew the harsh old world of Arabia. He couldn't meet the challenge of the rich new one. By 1966, just five years after oil had first been found in Abu Dhabi, Shackwood's wealth destroyed him. Zaid sent him into exile and took command himself, ready to say farewell to the old Arabia. But how was he going to do it? Even with a new ruler, the old life still goes on. A timeless, patient life, dominated by the desert and the unforgiving sun. Arabia is a land of terrible heat and terrible bareness. A tract of desert as big as Western Europe, practically untouched by the world until a few years ago. To anybody who doesn't live there, it seems a land of mystery and romance, full of the exotic promise of the veil. There are still people who think of it as the land of harems and the Arabians. In reality, it's a harsh and lonely place. Only water makes Arabia bearable. Where there's water, there's life. Water is so important that the Arabian oasis became the direct inspiration of the Muslim idea of heaven. And no wonder, when you come to the cool shade of the date gardens after the heat and emptiness of the desert, the oasis seems literally heavenly, a place of pure pleasure. <laughs> Every well in the desert is like a port. The camel caravans cross the desert like ships cross the sea. There are no frontiers, no fixed territory, no land belonging to anyone. There are just the wandering Bedouin and their camels, as attached to each other as sailors in their ships, bringing their trade to the desert markets. <laughs> It's a hard life in Arabia, and it breeds hard men, but it's as perfectly adjusted now to the hard land it's lived in as it was in the days of Abraham, the father of all the tribes. There's still a sort of biblical rhythm about it. If you want to know what the loaves looked like in the Bible parable, here they are, baking in Arabia today just as they did 2,000 years ago on the shores of Galilee. And I don't suppose the fish have changed much either. <laughs> the women of Arabia still hide behind the veil, as Arabia itself has done for centuries. <laughs> a 
Around the coasts, the Arab boats are made today by hand and eye and ancient equipment, much as they were when the spice trade and the slave trade kept them busy from China to the shores of Africa. <laughs> to the Arabs, the sea was a source of wealth that the barren land could not provide. Fishing, pearling, trading, smuggling, and especially piracy. Arab sailors in the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf preyed on the ships of Europe in the Indian trade. In the end, their piracy was their downfall. With a few naval sloops and some of the queerest treaties ever devised by man, the British Empire imposed on two-thirds of Arabia's coast the thin red line of peace. But neither the empire nor peace got much further than that. The sea was all anybody cared about. As long as that was safe, the land could rot, and so it did, in neglect and perpetual tribal warfare. Beyond the coast, most of Arabia lay untouched until 20 years ago. God is great. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. The religion of Arabia, by tradition, is as forbidding as the land. It's nearly 14 centuries since Arabia was the birthplace of Islam, but it's still the home of the most devoted of all the followers of Muhammad. Islam means submission to the will of God. In the desert, there isn't much you can do but submit and pray for God's mercy. Submission makes everyone equal. A ruler like Zaid is no different from other men in the sight of God. He submits like them, and wherever he is, he prays like them, and with them too. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet decreed that the faithful must pray five times a day from dawn to dusk. You can pray together or alone, with a priest or without one. But your submission to God is complete. You're his slave. And you can count on your fingers like a rosary in 99 different ways. May God be praised. May God be praised. May God be praised. Oil has ended the centuries of Arabian isolation. Oil means money. It's worth nearly $6,000 million a year around the Persian Gulf alone. And although most of the Arabian oil fields have been in production less than 20 years, their wealth is cracking the old life of Arabia wide open. To most of us, oil may be just the stuff that drives the car. To Arabia, it's a revolution. There isn't a thing it leaves untouched. It makes the desert rich. It brings the prospectors and the lawyers and the map makers to divide it. For the first time in history, oil brings soldiers to enforce peace inside Arabia. Frontiers need soldiers to patrol them. Prospectors need soldiers to protect them. So the tribesmen who once fought each other and raided the ships and commerce of the world are paid and trained as soldiers to maintain the new law. 
the poachers of a thousand years have been turned in a generation into gamekeepers. Two hundred and forty-five, sir. Two four five. Money begins to make its mark everywhere. The sheikh gets millions. The soldier only a scrap, but it buys a new life for both of them. 302, sir. 302. Do for it, sir. You On his hunting trip, Zaid chases the desert game with a string of falcons as long as his purse. Twenty years ago, he'd probably have gone hunting on foot with only a few birds to help him. Now he takes anything up to a hundred. Each of Zaid's followers has a falcon to look after. They train them, stroke them, talk to them, practically sleep with them. Like racehorses, they're the pampered darlings of a rich man's camp. And like racehorses, they cost big money. A good bird will fetch $600 or more imported from Syria or Iraq. And with so much oil money in Arabia now, the price is rising every year. Nothing escapes the touch of money. Money changes all relationships. When Zaid visits his neighbors now, the traditional feast for a visitor becomes an offering to a wealthy benefactor instead. Unlike many of Arabia's oil millionaires, Zaid believes in sharing his wealth. He told me once, the oil business is like a lottery. I might still be poor and my neighbors might be rich, so we ought to help each other. He's already given away millions. Zaid's host at this feast was one of his poorest neighbors. But now that Zaid has touched his palm with silver, he won't be quite so poor. <laughs> the feast is traditional. Goat's meat, chicken and rice. And when the VIPs are finished, the lesser men move in. It's always the custom in Arabia for the poor to eat at the rich man's table, or rather, off the rich man's floor. When this lot have finished, there'll still be more to come. 
in descending order of rank and ascending order of hunger. It's not the most elegant spectacle, and it's not the choicest food, but in a harsh and hungry land, any excuse is welcome for a blowout, especially when it's held for a man with money. مادام فكري سالي كل هجاس بمعان قلتها بالتمامه معنا على ما دار القلب واحتاس The old Arabia pulls at the heart. The world where Zaid was raised, and where he always likes to be, around the campfire in the cool desert night, among his men, listening to those endless Arab fairy tales that the audience knows as well as the storyteller, of love and beauty and the thousand and one nights. When the hunting's over and the caravan's resting, this is how they've passed the time for a thousand years. This is the old and sometimes beautiful Arabia, where time is endless and patience more so. <laughs> but in the new Arabia, time is money, and that pulls at the purse strings. This is the Arabia of the air-conditioned desert, the sanitized, sterilized caravan of the 20th century, with its international wealth and international accents. <laughs> For these people, the old Arabia hardly exists. The mystery and the romance, or the harshness and the poverty, it's all one in the oil company's pay packet. See you guys later. To them, Arabia is just another job. fairy tale is over, and everyone now will live happily ever after in the dream world of the Arabian Nights. But in the real world of Arabia tomorrow, it's not so easy. Not even Zaid's best friends can promise him a happy ending to his modern fairy tale that's only just begun. You can't reconcile the old life with a hundred million dollars a year as his brother Shackwood learned. You can't even choose whether you'll have the old life or the new. God and the oil business have already chosen for you. From now on, you can only try to ride the terrible tiger of the 20th century and wonder if it will not eat you in the end. <laughs>